So hello and welcome to our latest MCSB podcast here at the University of Glasgow with me, Sharon Kelly. And me, Anir Pandu. And today we are joined by Dr Lucy Alford, a researcher who's been working here at the University um, in the labs of Professor Shireen Davis and Julian Dow. Yes, that's correct. So Lucy, you're usually the interviewer in this podcast, so how does it feel uh, being at the other side of the table today? I'm actually terrified. I think I needed this experience before I started the podcast and that I would have known what the interviewees were going through, but no, I'm I'm terrified, so please be be gentle with me. (laughs) I I definitely will, don't worry, I'm terrified too. (laughs) So Lucy, um, tell us a little bit about your background. I mean, if people are aware that you are very engaged in in science engagement with public, but for those of us who don't know too much about you, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Of course. What inspired you to pursue a career in science? Yes, so... um I actually wasn't going to pursue a career in science. I was actually always very artistic. Um, and I was always very good at art in school and very good at science. Um, and I remember when I had to do my UCAS form and apply for universities, it came to the crunch of, do I go for an art career or do I go for a science career? And in the end, I decided that science was probably easier to do as a career and keep art as a hobby, if that makes sense. It wouldn't be easier the other way around, do art as a career and keep science as a hobby. So that was the motivation for a science career. And I've always just had a very inquiring mind. So I've always been somebody who wanted to take the pen to pieces as a child to figure out how it gets put back together and how it works. So I've always been very inquiring. Um, And I've always grown up with my parents being Well, my dad especially is very much into um, the great outdoors and he grew up in Hampshire and I think this sounds like something out of an Enid Blyton story, but he actually used to bunk off school so he could go bird watching and fishing. How incredibly twee is that? So So because of that, I've grown up and every, every weekend my parents would take me for walks down the river and I think that just encouraged a love for the outdoors and nature. So I then thought, okay, let's try and make science work as a career. So I applied to Cambridge as an undergraduate, not because I thought I was particularly Cambridge material, but I had this wonderful attitude as a teenager where I just thought, well, what's the worst that can happen? They say no. So just give it your best shot. Why not? So I just rather naively applied to Cambridge, not really putting any thought into it, and got offered a place. And one thing I would say is for anyone who's thinking of going to Cambridge, um, just go for it, give it a try. And actually, in my Cambridge interview, most of it was spent discussing my art because they were so fascinated that I was a scientist, but also very artistic as well. So I went to Cambridge, Um, And actually, by this point, I didn't want to go to Cambridge. I actually wanted to go to Southampton to do marine biology because Southampton University had just finished filming The Blue Planet. Mm -hmm. So when I went there on an interview day, they had all these amazing submersibles and I was just blown away by the excitement of it all. And I really wanted to Southampton marine biology. That's 100% what I wanted to do. And I remember in the interview, the guy said, you've been offered a place at Cambridge don't turn it down, you'll be a fool to turn it down. He said, go to Cambridge, do your degree, and go and do a master's in marine biology when you finish. So I thought, okay, that's what I'll do. So I went to Cambridge, had the best three years of my life. It was wonderful fun. Um, And then I went and did a master's in marine biology, but actually not in Southampton. I went to the University of Wales, Bangor. Um, So I was up for a year living on the Menai Straits, Uh, on Menai Bridge which is just beautiful part of the world Um, and then I thought you know what marine biology isn't for me after all I actually miss my insects Um, so I went back then um, to study insects with a PhD at the University of Birmingham under the uh, supervision of Professor Jeff Bale who is just the best supervisor ever I'm convinced he's one of great life's greatest raconteurs the stories he used to tell were phenomenal um, and then that just kind of cemented my love for science and creepy crawlies and the rest was history. 
So you grew up in Wales, is I that I did correct? indeed, yes. that's correct. So how did you find the transition from Wales to Cambridge and then to Birmingham? Was it quite a shock to your system or just um, an adventure of excitement? I... Moving moving to Cambridge was brilliant fun because suddenly at 18, moving away from home, creating friends for life is wonderful. You just, you create bonds at undergraduate, um, close, as close as sisters, honestly you do. So I just have such fond memories of my Cambridge years and I know many people would probably be... Um, they would probably have um, sort of preconceptions that maybe Cambridge is quite stuffy or old fashioned or maybe you're not going to fit in because I was, as you say, I'm from South Wales. I went to an ordinary comprehensive school. Um, and yes, there was there were people I knew at Cambridge who actually went to Eton. But did I notice a difference in how we interacted with, with one another? Absolutely not. We were actually just all people on the same course hanging out and having fun so I never noticed any sort of um, any issues with oh you're comprehensive you're not anything like that so again I just say if you fancy going to Cambridge go for it don't let it hold you back just because you're from South Wales um, in a normal comprehensive school like me just just go for it. Um, Bangor then was fantastic it was Menai, Menai Bridge was so small that literally everyone knew your name. It was like an episode of Cheers because you would go into the local pub and everyone would know your name and you would guarantee somebody you knew would be in the pub and you would just go there and join them for pub quiz. So fantastic social life. And then off the back of that, I moved to Birmingham, this big city, and mm. suddenly found the loneliest I have ever felt in my life. Really? Whereas you would think, men, I, I was living on Anglesey on Menai Bridge, so it was so remote and such a small community. But then I went to Birmingham and just felt lost and hopeless mm. in this large city and really alone. So that was probably the largest readjust, readjustment period in my life. But again, you settle in and... Things are maybe hard for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, but you soon settle in and form form good friends. And then by the time your three years are up, you never want to move, you leave then because you're so settled. So, so with that in mind, um, you then decided to come to Glasgow. Is that what you did next, or did no? You go so off the that? back of Birmingham, then I actually wrote a fellowship. So um, that was a Marie Curie fellowship that saw me move to France for two years. Then, um, and off the back of that, I then moved to Glasgow. Now, my motivations for moving to Glasgow is I've always been interested in insects and primarily the aphids. I've always loved aphids uh, and they're a big um, pest insect. Nothing is safe from aphids, they're an absolute nightmare. They just create a lot of mechanical damage as well as spreading diseases. So I've always been interested in these as a pest, a group of pest insects and how we can control them. So the work of uh, my fellowship in France before moving to Glasgow was all to do with the natural enemies and parasitoids of these aphids. So it was sort of biological control, so sort of more softer methods of controlling these aphids. And then I saw this position in Glasgow that was looking at issues of pest control from a slightly harder angle. So that was using um, insect neuropeptides, which are, which are essentially like um, insect hormones, and they control all aspects of insect biology from reproduction, growth, movement, everything is controlled by these neuropeptides. And the aim of the project here in Glasgow is how we can create neuropeptide mimetics that are sort of altered in a certain way to Im impede these natural um, functions of insects. So essentially, if we can interfere with those functions, can we make the insect less fit and therefore um, make, like reduce them in numbers, but without literally obliterating everything like non-specific pesticides? Um, so the great thing about neuropeptides as well is they're very, um, very specific. So we were looking, can we create something that is specifically targeting an insect pest, but leaving the beneficial such as the bumblebees, honeybees, all those um, beneficial predators and pollinating species, can we leave them unharmed? So I was quite interested in that because I've, I've 
done a lot of pest control from the softer biological control methods and I thought wow let's go and look at uh, pest control from a completely different angle. So actually moving to Glasgow it was a bit of a step down the um, grading system if you like because I then initially came as a research assistant I then went for promotion as a research associate so that was a step down given that I came from France as a research fellow but I was really interested in getting a bit more um, molecular experience before I went too high up so that's what that was a really a really wise move I I presume, given that you've been very successful yeah. in, in securing another fellowship. Yes. Um, I wondered if, I mean, it's sad for us that you're leaving, but obviously quite amazing for you, and it's a wonderful opportunity. I wonder if you could give us a little bit of background about what you're proposing to do and, and the fellowship you've actually secured. Of course. So the fellowship I've got is a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. Um, and this is enabling me to go to France for two years. And what I'm interested in is how we can alter um, agricultural systems to increase ecosystem service provision. So I'm interested in how we can encourage pollination and predation by these diverse insects within an agro ecosystem. However, as everyone is aware, agroecosystems, they have been greatly simplified over the last 50 to 60 years with massive intensification. We've got large use of chemical insecticides that just literally obliterate everything. So our food webs and our ecosystems are becoming increasingly simplified. So how can we get that diversity back into the ecosystem? But not just that, recent research has shown that measures put in place to be beneficial to, say, predators can actually be um, detrimental to pollination, um, pollinators and vice versa, which suggests there could actually be this antagonistic relationship yeah. between the ecosystem service ecosystem services of predation and pollination. So my research in France will also look at how we can balance that trade-off to create the sort of maximally functioning agro ecosystem where all these wonderful services provided by the ecosystem are naturally being performed so we don't need to have such human in intervention through the sort of intensive farming and application of pesticides. Now that sounds like a really really interesting and, and potentially life-saving um, strategy given the way our country or our environment is going should I say. Um, so, so the fellowship you applied for, that was another Marie Curie yes, fellowship? Yes, right? so my original one that I applied for a few years ago was a Marie Curie Intra-European Fellowship. This one now is a Marie Curie Individual Fellowship. I'm not entirely sure what the difference is between the two. They seem very similar, so whether it's just a name change, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, so I've had quite a bit of success with Marie Curie funding. Um, so I thought I would give it another go and I was successful. Again, if you don't if you don't try you yeah, you'll never know. If you exactly. Don't try. So with respect to you were obviously you took this sort of sidestep um, in order to get to the point where you wish to be pursuing the independent career. Um, did you find the Institute um, provided some support in that context with grant writing, with um, role models, mentoring, etc? Well, what I found in the university is I honestly believe the more you get involved, the more, the more you gain. Yes. Um, so I'm not saying get involved for selfish reasons, but it was really by getting involved within the Institute that... Um, I really, um, I really learned more, I guess, about my career pathway. And one of the ways I got involved in the institute is through Professor Neil Bullard, who is the head of the institute. Um, one of his initiatives was cre to create this ECR committee made up of early career researchers. Um, and I joined that committee. And what was so great about this committee is it was a committee of ECRs 
putting together events for ECR. So this was things that they felt would be of most benefit to them. And one of the things to come out of that was a um, grant writing workshop. So again, this was all as ECRs coming together and putting on this event. But because it was ECR led, it meant that it was really, really helpful and very um, impactful as well. And I honestly think it is the best grant writing workshop I've ever been to. We also um, put on um, ECR Away Days, which was a fantastic way to get to know everyone else in your um, in the department. Um, and I think that is so important in science to get involved, learn about the career options early on so if you're interested in going down the fellowship route learn um, as soon as possible how to write grant applications and just get given it a go but also learn to know who else is in your institute because you can learn from them maybe even collaborate with them Um, and I definitely think just give it a go I think that's always been my kind of motto just go for it because what's that worst that can happen if you're not if it's not successful well <coughs> dust yourself off and try again, again. Yes. exactly yeah, absolutely and um, so when you wrote your grant proposal for the fellowship did someone help you to look over it and give you some ideas or feedback on it or did you just sit down and write it and send it off i just pretty much sat down and wrote it I am collaborating with somebody in France at the University of Rennes, um, so that's Professor Joanne Van Baren. Um, and when I had a more final um, uh, grant application, I sent it over to Joanne, and Joanne gave her feedback on it and told me tweaks um, to make. And actually, I probably shouldn't admit this, but the University of Rennes, because that was my um, sort of the receiving yes, institute, yes. if you like they have a very good system where you're assigned somebody within the university who will help you through the process and even they could look over it and give me give me feedback um, on the grant application on how to improve it based on their experience of what has been successful in previous years um, so that's another thing I would say is when doing grant applications or fellowship applications, really try and get your hands on previously successful grants so you can have a look at what a successful grant looks like and how you can um, sort of base your application on a successful grant application. And one thing as well is just get trying. I mean, I started writing grant applications almost straight off the back of my PhD. And I mean, I probably should have started during my PhD, even if it's just small pots of money, little travel grants here, there and everything. It all adds to your CV. And it's all, once you know how to write a grant application, it's a skill that you just apply to all the different funding bodies. So it's a skill that you need to learn and practice. So start, why not start doing it from an early age? It's definitely a skill that you can develop. Yes, and definitely. the more you yes. do it, you are going to get better. Um, so in a, in a previous conversation you and I have had, um, you mentioned the importance of having access to successful grants. Absolutely. Um, and so you said in a previous institution there was a repository. Yeah, so that was actually the University of Birmingham. And for any grant application, they actually had a repository where people would um, sort of enable their successful or maybe even unsuccessful grant applications to be read by people who were looking to apply further down the line to the same funding bodies. And I think that is a wonderful tool to have um, have available when writing applications. So I definitely think that is something the University of Glasgow um, should should look into because it's very, very beneficial. Um, and if a university doesn't have such a repository as that, then speak to your colleagues and peers yes. and see if they've got if they've had experience because I know when this time last year I was actually um, thinking of putting in a BBSRC um, fellowship application and Brian Hudson who is here at the institute as well he has had a lot of experience with BBSRC and he kindly agreed to sit with me for half an hour and just give me all his pills of wisdom on what BBSRC are like and he actually gave me his 
um, his previous um, application as well to help me when it came to mine. In the end, I didn't actually go for the BBSRC. Um, and by that point, I knew my Marie Curie had been successful, but that was just wonderful. Just a colleague who had that experience and he was willing to share that experience with me. So so that's really interesting because obviously this colleague, Brian, um, is in a totally different field and yet he can demonstrate good practice and and, and how to go about Absolutely, absolutely, writing. yeah. So it doesn't need to be something in your field because um, one thing for me here in um, the university, um, the MCSB Institute, is I am actually the odd one out. I am a whole organism biologist um, and a zoologist, and I'm here in a very molecular heavy um, institute. But that doesn't mean I can't get um, get tips and advice from those applications because it's still the same. You're still trying to tell a story and you're tr still trying to convince the funding body that your research why it's so imperative that this research gets done. So it's the same skills and the same message regardless of your background and your research area. So would you recommend early career res researchers to seek out someone who could be an informal or a formal mentor? Yes, absolutely. Um, I find mentors very, very helpful. And I've always had an informal mentor in somebody called Dr. Scott Haywood, who is at the University of Birmingham. Now, Scott Hayward um, joined the lab um, when I was doing my PhD with um, Professor Jeff Bale. And Pro Professor Jeff Bale was almost getting to retirement age. And um, Scott joined the institute as a young um, lecturer and started building his lab group. And our research was very, very similar because he was interested in um, stress tolerance in insects. And I had my interest, my sort of sideline in aphids and stress tolerance and how that how that affects sort of um, large scale patterns of aphid distribution and what that means for pest control. So there was a lot of overlap there. And be, because Scott has always been just a little bit ahead of me in his career, um, he's always been a great sounding board and always willing to help me. And whenever I've had to make a career decision, I've always been straight off emailing Scott saying, Scott, this is what the situation is, what do you think? And he always gives such wonderful, very impartial, well thought out advice. And it's just great to have a figure like that who can really um, just act as a sounding board. And often you've got your gut feeling, you know what the right option is, but sometimes it's nice to just have, have that um, sort of confirmation that you're making the right, the right decision from somebody else. So clearly, Lucy, that demonstrates the, the importance of networking and you have been in a number of institutions throughout the early part of your career which have really helped to, to forge links which have been beneficial to you Absolutely, in, in your yeah. independent strategy. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think network, networking is always important because, I mean, the obvious one is um, collaboration and of, is often at the sort of crossover and fringes of research that new novel ideas are generated. But not just that, but because then you have a support network throughout throughout the UK and beyond and there's always somebody that you can call on um, for advice um, whether that is personal career advice scientific advice um, and then interesting interesting ideas can be generated as well indeed so I have a role in the Institute as Athena Swan champion and we have a bronze award which is the first stage of our, our journey on that front um, and we're committed to embedding equality and diversity um, into our mission as we go forward as an institute. And we're hoping to um, apply for our silver award in the autumn. I was just wondering what your impression of being a woman in science is up until this stage of your career. And do you see any challenges going forward in the future? Um, if I'm entirely honest, I don't think it's ever occurred to me that, yes, I'm a woman in science. I've always just been in a lab group and interacted with my colleagues as colleagues and friends, regardless of if they're a woman like me or a man. Now I come to think of it, actually, it's 
quite interesting how here in Glasgow I'm in a very male dominated lab yet all my previous labs have been very female dominated so I mm. don't know whether that could be subject specific perhaps maybe more zoology and whole organism stuff maybe that's of more appeal and interest to the women and that's why I've always had previously more female dominated labs and now in the institute um, I have more male colleagues I don't know but I mean my current lab here at the University of Glasgow is so wonderfully wonderfully diverse I'm they, I'm in a minority being a woman, but as I said, that never never really occurred to me. And my some of my sort of great friends that I've developed here at the university, they're so multicultural. We've got Indian, Nepalese, Spanish, French Moroccan, Malaysian, just so many, so many diverse um diverse groups. Um and it just makes for a really interesting lab group because um, you've got so many different stories and exciting tales to tell and another great thing as well is the food my goodness all mm. the different food you can experience now I mean um, Sora from Nepal he would always bring in Nepalese mo well I say Nepalese I think they're actually Tibetan Momo which is one of my favorite foods ever Ania who was originally from India who sat next to me now the amount of times I've been invited over his house and his wife is the best cook ever so there is, it's just wonderful to yes, have yeah. have an opportunity to meet so many wonderfully diverse people. And it actually occurred to me the other day that there is probably not many areas of the world where I could find myself and I wouldn't be able to call on a former friend or colleague who is now back in their home country or working in a different country. So it's just really nice to think you've actually got this network throughout the whole world of all these friends and former yeah, colleagues that you can call absolutely. upon. Yeah. So how did you find Glasgow as a city compared with, say, Birmingham or I Cambridge? I love Glasgow. When I first moved here, I moved here in um, January 2016 and it was the most horrific winter and it rained continuously for about three months. And we're not talking rain, we're talking Monsoon. biblical <laughs> biblical rain. Yes. I was been ready to go and build an ark. It was terrible. And I just remember just getting into work day after day, head to waterproofs, but still being soaking wet and soggy and thinking, what am I doing coming up to Scotland? But as soon as we realised that was just a fluke winter, I absolutely love Glasgow as a city. I think it's so... Um, just, yeah, it's a very diverse, interesting, cultural city. Um, through being in Glasgow, I've really got into opera because you've got the mm -hmm. uh, Scottish yes. Opera Company that puts on the best performances right here in Glasgow. So I go to every single one of their productions. Um, you've got all these wonderful art galleries beautiful architecture and then drive a couple of minutes up the road and suddenly you can be in Loch Lomond, the Trossachs, Glencoe, everything just is on your at your fingertips. All these wonderful landscapes and fantastic mountains to climb as well. So just absolutely, absolutely wonderful. Well that is good to hear as a Glasgow born girl. <laughs> um, and what do you do, what do you like to do to de-stress? I mean you're in a very challenging academic environment and, and it can be um, quite an onerous uh, requirement, all the things you have to do in the lab. What do you do to de-stress when you leave the lab? Um, well, I've always kept my art on as a hobby, as I said, and that's a very therapeutic. So I like to um, dabble in my art, um, which I try to do. My favourite artist, uh, Egon Schiele, um, I love Jean-Michel Basquiat, so I often try to do paintings in the style yeah, of those yeah. artists. So my flat in Glasgow, the walls are covered with all these bizarre portraits that I've, that I've painted. So I like to paint. Um, I also like to, so my husband is a guitarist, so I often like to design posters mm. um, for his music and for other bands actually. So I grew up loving the sort of psychedelic art posters mm -hmm. of um, the work of say Bonnie McLean and um, Wes Wilson who designed posters in the 60s for the Fillmore Auditorium. Um, loved, loved their artwork growing up. 
Um, so I've kind of continued that on and I love designing psychedelic posters so that's another thing I do to unwind. Being in Scotland as well, so many wonderful mountains so I like climbing mountains. I've ticked off a couple of Munros, Excellent. Munros myself so yeah just trying to keep things artistic or get out in the wilderness and, and the mindfulness yeah yes. exactly and did your has your husband followed you throughout your career uh no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we met each other after my phd when i moved back to south wales and he's a south wales boy himself uh, and then not long after that i got a job and moved to birmingham after that i moved to france then I moved to Scotland and now I'm back moving to France so I think he thinks I don't like him and I'm just trying to get <laughs> as far away from him as possible but because he's got his own career and his career is very much rooted in South Wales at the moment we're kind of having to live slightly double lives but it's okay it, it's working and we see each other as often as often yeah. as we can what kind of music does he like to perform um he is a guitarist and he does um sort of yeah, blues rock music, so very sort of inspired by Jimi Hendrix, Eric Clapton. His current band has that um, sort of modern Fleetwood, Fleetwood Mac feel to it. They like to consider themselves a rock and soul. Yeah, that's a nice, yeah. a nice genre of music. Yeah. Um, so now in the tradition of Desert Island Discs, okay. um, <laughs> I'd like to ask you some more personal questions about the things you like. I mean, if you were stranded on a, on a desert island or in a lab in the middle of nowhere, um, what kind of music would you take and what kind of book would you read and what would be your favourite luxury that you would not be able to live without? Okay, I think my favourite luxury would have to be an uh, endless supply of tea and dark chocolate mm. because I'm convinced <laughs> that if I could get all the nutrients and vitamins and minerals from dark chocolate and tea alone, I would probably survive Live on forever. just that. <laughs> yeah. So one of my favourite teas is this um, chocolate and rose tea. So I like flavoured black tea. So that's like Turkish Delight in a mug. It's amazing. And then mm. some really nice dark chocolate. So that would be my luxury. My, m my music to listen to, I'm very sorry, I wouldn't be taking my husband's music, even though it's very good, but I am a Led Zeppelin girl okay. um, to the core, so I probably have to take some Led Zeppelin. And then, but what book would I take? Um, that is a good question. I think... One of my favourite books of all times is probably Lilita. And it's interesting because in the recent podcast we did with Bethany Fleming, she actually mm -hmm. said her favourite book was A Clockwork Orange. Now, what I said to Bethany about, I really like A Clockwork Orange as well. And I think it really questions your own sort of um, moral compass because in A Clockwork Orange I find it really interesting that Alex and his droogs are obviously evil people but by the end you find yourself almost fighting with yourself because you're feeling sympathetic towards them and I feel very much the same with Lolita mm. in that I find myself towards the end of the book questioning who the real victim is yeah. um, so I like that book um, I think that's probably one of my favourite books but then maybe on a desert island maybe I would just want something something a bit more light-hearted so I might even go for an Esbon puzzle adventure book so I don't know mm -hmm. if any children in the 80s remember Esbon puzzle adventure books where they were those fantastic drawn books and you would always be off on adventures in sort of um, underground cities or lost temples and you would always have to do the little um, mm -hmm. puzzle at the end of the page before you could turn the next page so maybe something like that because that can provide me with hours of entertainment as well a good stimulation <laughs> so um, people often ask on these podcasts to, to ask us to ask you more about yourself so if I was to ask you things like what was your favorite food what would you uh, say I'm really embarrassed to admit this, but I am a British girl to the core, so I love nothing more than roast beef in Yorkshire oh, puddings or chips that. from the chip shop, yeah, just yeah. British bland food. I mean, I know we get a bit of a bad rep on a global scale, but British bland food with a bit of gravy, I can't, <laughs> you can't beat it as far as I'm Indeed. concerned. Very good. And your favourite city out of all the ones you've lived in so far? Oh... 
that's a toughie. I think for diversity of things to get involved in, it would definitely be Glasgow mm -hmm. um, because it caters for everything, whether you want the outdoorsy life or the city culture, it's got everything. Uh, Wren in France obviously has the weather, but I think I would say Cambridge. I think Cambridge has yeah. such a place in my heart and I think as well because it was just such a happy time in my life I mean I'm not saying I'm miserable now no, but I think going away to university for the first time it's such a momentous occasion and I created such wonderful memories so I think I'd have to say Cambridge very good okay one of these questions we always ask is what did you want to be when you grew up um which you've said before or did you you know what, my career choices as a child were all very strange. At one point I wanted to be a rally driver. Um, I always liked I always liked art, so maybe something a bit more artistic, but then I did I always quite like the idea of being a marine biologist as well. So I don't know. I think it depended as a child. It would have depended what day you caught me on, whether I was gonna be a rally driver or the next Egon Sheila. Quite a diverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably know the answer to this, but what is your claim to fame? Um, okay, I have a few bizarre claim to fame. I think one of the most unusual claim to fame is I once found myself in Slash's changing room, so Slash of Guns and Roses. The guitar. Yes discussing the book War and Peace. Seriously? Seriously. How fantastic is that? There's no sex, drugs, rock and roll, talking, great literature. Um, and also I've been in a music video for Irish rock group, The Answer. So there we go. If somebody oh, yeah. wants to go through their back catalogue and try and spot me in their Just music get video. The YouTube video. <laughs> Will you miss Glasgow? Oh, absolutely, that, yeah. absolutely. I will indeed, and I, I will hopefully come back, come yeah. back lots. Yeah, we would, we would love to have you back. You've yeah. been very, very, very um, good at profiling science and and, and encouraging and, and very inspirational to to young scientists. So oh, thank you so thank much you. for your time today, and we at Glasgow wish you all the best thank in you your very future. Much. And in the Thank University you of for Rennes. having me for the last three and a half years and making my time so wonderfully enjoyable. It shall be hard to leave in a few weeks' time. So well, we thank look you very forward much. to seeing you again. Wonderful. So thank, thank you. Very you. Much. Right, thank you.